Welcome to The Brian Buffini Show, where we explore the mindsets, motivation, and methodologies of success. Here's your host, Brian Buffini. Well, the top of the morning to you. Very excited for you to be on today's show. I have a man who's quickly become just a good friend. He was a speaker at our Mastermind Summit and got rave reviews and feedback on the authenticity, the sincerity, and the relevance of Kevin Brown's message. And I want to introduce you to Kevin today. He grew up in Muskegon, Michigan, blue-collar roots, hard-working guy. His resume is quite eclectic. It's a mix of stops that ultimately led him to purchase a franchise at the age of 17. Want to hear about that? Uh, streetwise kid, uh, never quit attitude. Uh, eventually works himself up into the executive boardroom. And for nearly two decades, Kevin was a sales and marketing executive. And we love sales and marketing people here. And took a little known family business to help him become an industry giant with over $2 billion in sales annually. And so after a career in franchising that spanned 30 years, Kevin decided to retire from corporate America, pursue his passion. He wrote a fabulous book called The Hero Effect, Being Your Best When It Matters Most. I love that book. It's a one-day read full of great stuff and stories and how-tos. Kevin presents all over North America and beyond. Kevin, we're delighted to have you on the show today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. It's my honor to be with you and, and your listeners. This is a bucket list for me, so thanks for having me. <laughs> Great stuff. Well, let's dive right in. Kind of give us a little background. So what was life like growing up in the Brown family in Muskegon, Michigan? Yeah, life was good. We were poor, but we didn't know it. So uh, <laughs> we had, you know, we had everything we needed. We uh, we loved each other, but uh, life was good until, uh, until I was a teenager. Life got uh, a little difficult. I quit school. In the 10th grade, I uh, never finished high school, never went to college. I convinced my dad to, uh, to give me a loan when I was 17 years old. I bought a, bought a franchise, and people are always impressed by that, and they're always excited until I tell them that I failed miserably as a, uh, as a new entrepreneur at age 17. I bought into a company called Leadership Management Institute. Mm. It was really my, uh, my, my entry into the personal development industry a guy by the name of Paul J. Meyer. Oh yeah, and um, you you know you you know that story. So mm -hmm. Paul J. Meyer um, opened a lot of doors and introduced me to a lot of folks. But I was traipsing through the, the the streets of Muskegon, Michigan, teach you know telling business owners and entrepreneurs that I could make them more productive, make their people more successful, teach them <laughs> how to sell more. And they said, Hey, you go get twenty years experience, right. and you Come back here, and, right? Uh, and you can take our stage. And so. You know, some 30 plus years later to be doing what I'm doing now in the personal development field is pretty quite extraordinary. Yeah, it's extraordinary. It's been it's been quite a quite a deal. You talk about in the book, it was a pivotal point in your life when you chose to pack up your stuff into a green duffel bag and leave home. Yeah. What, what drove you to make that decision? I went through a dark period in my life. I, I, you know, for three or four years as a teenager, I was I was let down by some some adults that I trusted very much, mm -hmm. and there's there's a lot to that story. But I think we could park that there and just say life kind of took a left turn mm -hmm. at about the age of 13, and it, and it continued to to spiral out of control. and And I took that situation and I made some really poor decisions, created some really poor habits, and I aligned myself with some people that uh, that weren't really good for me. And it was the first time in my life that I was introduced to the concept that uh, I later learned from Jim Rohn and others that, you know, we become a product of our environment. We become a product of the people that we spend time with and associate with. We start to think like them, act like them, and we become very much like them. And life just spiraled out of control till I quit school and, you know, searching for answers. That's what led to uh, begging my dad to help me uh, buy a franchise. And I did, and that didn't work out. I was married at age 18 and that fell apart because I had not yet figured out how to become who I needed to become mm. to step into the destiny that was out there for me. Mm -hmm. And destiny was shaped. You met a guy by the name of David as we fast forward here a yeah. little bit. Talk to us about yeah. David and what that was all about. Well, Brian, you are the, the master of mentorship and, uh, you know, mentoring others is such a critical role. And there's a lot of role, role models that show up in our lives, some good, some bad. Some mm -hmm. teach us what not to be like, and others teach us exactly what we should be like. And, you know, as I was racing through life, burning every bridge I walked across, 
breaking a lot of promises, making a lot of really stupid choices. I was really at the end of my rope. I, I'd been evicted from my apartment for the third time. I was living in my car. I, I didn't have anywhere to go. People who had given me a place to stay had given up on me because I was dragging that 13-year-old kid around everywhere, and I was right. using him as an excuse for not doing well. Mm-hmm. And I met a guy named David. David was a crusty old sales guy from South Texas. He was looking for a salesperson. I was broke. I was desperate looking for money. And he, for whatever reason, he took pity on this kid, and he took me under his wing, and he taught me how to sell, and he gave me a skill set that changed my life profoundly. The, the skill set of selling and being able to communicate profoundly changed my life financially and professionally. But in addition to teaching me how to sell, this guy taught me how to see. He was the first one in my life who took the storyline of a 13-year-old kid and said, you know what, your past is a place of reference, not a place of residence. He said the past doesn't equal the future. We've heard that from Tony Robbins over the years. The past does not have to become your destiny. And he went to work on me every day, and he just tripped on me, and he put put good things in my mind, and he gave me books to read, and he taught me the things. He loaned me confidence that I didn't have in myself, and this mentor became like a second father to me. How long was that relationship? How long were you guys connected like that? That relationship went on probably for, uh, gosh, better part of a decade, Mm. I would say, and uh, David ultimately, he was a a four-time cancer survivor. They gave him six months to live, and he lived 10 years after that. Mm. And uh, he got the diagnosis not long after we, we started working together. And this guy was pouring into me, and, and he was believing, and he was the eternal optimist. And this guy just wouldn't let me give up. And then when cancer came his way, and, you know, we had, a, we had the boss and subordinate relationship as he was teaching me how to sell. But then the, the, the real mentorship happened over about a decade. And for most of that decade, David was fighting and beating cancer. Mm. And he... He, uh, he, he practiced what he preached, Brian. He walked his talk, and he said, you know what? I don't have to accept that diagnosis as my prognosis. Mm. And every day he, he worked on his mind, and he had a picture. And we had some people around us, a guy by the name of Dwight O'Neill, a fantastic motivational teacher who, who helped David. And, you know, the, you know, the question is always is, who, who motivates the motivator? Right. Who leads the, the leader? And we all need people. We all need coaches. We all need people that will pour into us and make us better than we could have ever been on our own. Well, you know, so it's very easy for somebody listening going, man, I, you know, I've had difficult times. I may have had even similar dark period experiences to, mm-hmm. to Kevin. You know, this was your path and this was your journey. And, and God blessed you by sending this guy along. And while he was fighting through his own cancer yeah. battle, he took you under his wing and, and set you about. Let me talk to you, one salesman to another. What were some of the best mm-hmm. things he taught you about selling? What were some of the principles you, you think of today and things you've applied that really stuck with you? You know, it's amazing. Not, not only did he teach me how to sell, man, everything he taught me about selling really translates to life and being a good communicator and, and being a, a good partner, whether it's with our family or with our with our teams or just with each other as human beings. He mm-hmm. taught me to, to talk a lot less than I listen and to get really, really good at asking questions mm-hmm. and to never stop seeking what it is somebody truly desires to find. Because, you know, when we start selling to people, you know, they're looking to bridge the gap between where they are and someplace new. And the only way you can figure out how to bridge the gap is to ask them questions mm. and to find out what's important to them, find out what their goals are, and to find out what moves them, what motivates them, what encourages them, find out what's important to them. And if you'll make what is, what is important to them important to you, it's amazing how deep and meaningful those relationships become. And, you know, I tell people all the time. You know, any, anybody can do what you do. Anybody can sell. Anybody can read a book and learn how to ask questions. They can learn a sales process. They can learn a cycle. But the question is, who are you becoming in that process? You see, it's, it's not just about the process. It's about who we become in that process. And that's why, that's why what you do, what you do for so many people, you're the David to so many people because you not only teach them what to do, you teach them how to be. And when people really figure out how to be, that's what David gave me more than anything was how to be, because people are attracted to the right kind of people. People are attracted to people who can help them get from where they are to someplace new. People are attracted to people who have confidence and can solve problems, which is what we're all paid to do anyway, mm-hmm. to solve problems. You bet. And so Dave, David taught me those principles, and he, he kept it very basic and very simple. To, to prospect every day, to, to work your, your referral base, to drive those relationships deep, and people will bring you the work. People will bring you their friends because birds of a feather, as you know, mm-hmm. they flock together. 
And when you're doing business and you're doing a great job for one center of influence, they're going to tell everybody they know. And all of a sudden, people are calling you because they've heard you're the best at what you do and that you can help solve their problems and move the needle for them. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome stuff and true. And those are the principles. As we know, principles don't change. Tactics might. Right. Th those principles will be true 10, 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now. You know, ultimately, in the midst of all this, you're, you're applying these principles. You become the sales and marketing guy. You're, you're, you're on the fast track. But it seems like you always had in your desire, whether it was back to the Leadership Management Institute, from, from even a young age, you always had a desire, it seems, to influence, connect, communicate. Um, where did the whole message from the hero effect, where did that all come from? It was, uh, you know, I never, never, ever thought I would be out front. You know, I always thought I was that one-on-one -on -one person. You know, I was really, really good at connecting with people and, and helping them solve problems and selling, communicating, presenting. But I was never a, a, a guy that I, I envisioned would be on stage in front of thousands of people delivering a, a message. And, you know, I grew up listening to... Now, Earl Nightingale and The Strangest Secret, and all of the people that you mentioned, I've listened to all of them. Zig Ziglar was one of my earliest influences, Biscuits, Fleas, and Pump Handles was the first <laughs> book of his that I had, and I uh, bought it at a yard sale. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but, you know, when I think about this, this idea called the hero effect, uh, I had risen through the ranks of corporate America. I evolved as kind of the corporate guy. I was a sales and marketing executive. I was one of two non-family executives in a family business. And life was really good for a kid with no high school diploma. And long about 2007, I had somebody ask me if I'd be willing to give a speech about what it means to be a hero. And I enthusiastically said yes. <laughs> and as soon as I said yes, I immediately started freaking out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I went into panic mode. I, I started thinking, what you know, up to that point, Brian, I'd done the normal kinds of talks that executives give, you know, leadership, vision customer service, those kinds of things that we've all heard before. But this was this was different. I thought, you know, what do I know about being a hero? And I remember going to my wife, and she, she's always been my rock. She steadies me. She knows I, I go into Captain Freakout mode at, at the blink of an eye. And and she, she said something I'll never, ever forget. This is more than a decade ago. She took me by the hands, and she said, sweetheart, you're overthinking this. She said, if you want to talk about heroes, might I suggest that you go stand in front of the mirror and when your image fades, you will start to see the faces of the heroes that you should start talking about. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, let me put it to you this way. She said, the images that stand behind you in that mirror, the influencers in your life, the people who made you better than you could have ever been on your own. She said, make no mistake about it. You didn't get here by yourself. You had a lot of help. You had a lot of people who poured into you, gave you things you didn't have on your own. She said, if you want to talk about heroes, start there. Mm -hmm. She's a really smart lady. No, no doubt. And I went, and I went, man, I went and stood in front of the mirror and I stared at myself for an uncomfortable amount of time. And, and after a while, my, my image began to fade and I started to see the preachers and the teachers, friends, family, colleagues, uh, the, the people who had shaped my life, whether it was in person or via a cassette tape and books and all of the things that had been poured into my life. And I went back to, to my yellow pad and I wrote down a question. And the question was this, what does a hero look like? Mm. And Brian, from that day till now, my life has never, ever been the same. Mm. What does a hero look like? I've asked thousands of people that question. And starting with our military men and women who keep us free, who keep us safe, allow us to chase the dreams in our lives, to the world changers, Mandela, Martin Luther King Jr., Mother Teresa, first responders, teachers, coaches, moms, dads. I've heard every answer that you can possibly imagine. And every single human being I've ever asked the question, what does a hero look like? They've defined it as this. Heroes are ordinary people who do extraordinary things. And at first I thought, man, that's it. That's the that's that's it. That's that's the gold standard for what it means to be a hero. But the more I asked, the more I heard that, the more I started to wonder, is that really true? Something something was unsettled inside of me as I started as I kept hearing this, ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And it, it dawned on me one day that if we if we believe that, if we buy into that definition then we have to first convince ourselves that we're ordinary in the first place. Mm. We have to first buy into the idea that we were put here for no specific reason, that we were here to fit in and be like everybody else, to fly below the radar and make no significant contribution. And intellectually, I understand why we say it, because it aligns with our humility. But the truth of the matter is, and I believe this with my whole heart, I don't think there's a person listening. I don't think there's a person on this planet 
there's, there's not a person that's part of the Fenian company that was put here to make an ordinary contribution. Mm. In fact, my belief is this. I believe that we were created with talents, gifts, and abilities as unique as our fingerprints. And the truth of the matter is, the definition of a hero has been redefined in my life over the last decade to be not ordinary people doing extraordinary things, but to be extraordinary people who choose not to be ordinary. Mm, I like that. You might want to give me that again. Heroes are not ordinary people who do extraordinary things. They are, in fact, extraordinary people who choose not to be ordinary. Mm, not to be ordinary. I love that. Ordinary is a choice. And you and I, we've seen them. We've seen everybody. Every, we've all seen them. We've seen parents who make an ordinary decision as parents. We've seen spouses and significant others who make an ordinary choice. We've seen leaders. We've seen salespeople. We've seen people at large in life that show up and they make an ordinary decision every day of their lives. They, they show up and they do the minimum required to get by. They play the same game as everyone else, and there's no separation between them and the masses of people who show up every day. That's why when extraordinary people show up and choose not to be ordinary, it looks special. Right. Right? We're, we're drawn to them. They're the best of the best at what they do, whether it's in business, sports, entertainment. There's something we just stop in our tracks, and we admire the work, and we say there's something different. And not only do they play at a high level, they elevate the game for everybody on the team. Mm -hmm. And you and I have been influenced by some of these characters. You know, it's funny. You talked about Errol Nightingale. We're in the Nightingale studio right now recording this podcast. Diana Nightingale, Earl's oh, widow, came and opened up the studio at, all around the building here. Next door in our sales team, we have the Covey training room. We have the upstairs in coaching. We have the Ziegler conference room. We have the Mandino uh -huh. room. We have the Jim uh -huh. Rohn reading room, you know. And yeah. so, you know, paying homage to those guys. And, and those are people, yeah. like you said, who decided, I I'm just not going to do ordinary but ordinary also shows up in many different ways, and I would be remiss. I, I was so taken. I've seen our audience so taken with the story of Josh Brown, the story of Aunt B, because this also shifts gears into, because people go, oh, man, I can't be a Jim Rohn or an Earl Nightingale or, or speak on stage or whatever else. And I, Maybe you could just share a little bit of that powerful story on how here's an everyday hero that made a transformative impact. Yeah, you know what? I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. I wouldn't have a story or a message about heroes if it wasn't for really three or four people in my life, and one of them being my wife, the other being my son. His name is Josh. He's 21 years old. In fact, if you ask him his name, he'd tell you it's Josh Brown. He thinks it's hyphenated. <laughs> and uh, Josh has autism, and we've known that since Josh was a little guy. When he was five years old, they made a formal diagnosis of Autism, And I'll never forget sitting around a conference room table when he was five years old, doctors on one side, teachers on the other. Doctor spoke first, said, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, your son has autism. You need to understand there's some things that, that aren't going to happen for Josh. Josh is, is uneducable in many ways. He won't learn like the other kids. Most likely will not graduate. If he does, he'll get a special education diploma. There'll be an asterisk by his name. Hmm. And uh, I remember looking over at my wife, Lisa, and uh, the tears were streaming down her face. And I immediately started thinking about all of the things my son wasn't going to do. I started thinking about the life he wasn't going to live. The one that I vicariously wanted to live through him had just vanished. And I'm embarrassed by that as a father. It's amazing to me how often we'll buy into someone else's definition of what our life is to become. And I'm listening to this doctor talk, and I'm buying into what he's telling us. And I look back, and the teardrops were gone. And this look of determination swept over her face. And Thankfully, moms get a little something extra than most of us dads do. <laughs> uh, they're natural-born leaders with natural-born vision, especially when it comes to their babies. And she sees that boy for everything that he was born to be. And she did what leaders do, Brian. She took the storyline life gave us, and she started to rewrite it. Mm. She looked at her son, and she said, cover your ears. Don't you listen to him. She said, I heard what he said, sweetheart, but that's not your destiny. You keep your eyes right here. Mom's got a different plan for you. And for 17 years, I've had the privilege and honor of watching this leader with the title of mother do her work. Mm. And it's amazing to me when you've got a compelling vision for your life and for your business, the resources start to show up. I've watched as teachers, tutors, mentors, guides, coaches have showed up in this kid's life. And they've poured themselves into this kid, and it's been nothing short of miraculous because of one person's decision to not accept the storyline as their destiny. And What's sad to me, Brian, is so many people get up every day and they accept the storyline that life gives them. They accept it as their truth, right. and they walk it out every single day, and they never give one single thought 
to the fact that the pen is in their hands always. So this kid, this kid who wasn't supposed to uh, do a whole lot with his life, when he was seven years old, he discovered Walt Disney World. <laughs> and, and if you know anything at all about autism, when these kids get something on their brain, it's the only thing that exists in the whole wide world. And by nine years old, that's all he could do was eat, sleep, breathe Disney. And at nine years old, we took him to Disney. And it was one of the most remarkable experiences we ever had. And Josh has a lot of food allergies, a lot of things that we try to, to stay away from and, and things that help with his autism if we can eliminate them from his diet. And when we got to Walt Disney World, we went for breakfast the first day and we went down to this restaurant and waitress came over and my wife immediately started to explain everything that Josh can have and everything that he can't have. And before she could finish, the waitress kind of cut her off and said, ma'am, I'm not going to be able to take your order. You need to speak to the executive chef. And executive chef came out. Her name was B, B E A. And she came out and she said, I understand somebody's on a special diet. How can I help? And she started writing down everything that Lisa said he could have and everything that he, that he can't have. And when she was done, she looked at Josh and she called him Sunshine. She said, Sunshine, what would you like? What would you like for breakfast? And he said, apple pancakes, please. That's his favorite. She said, Sunshine, I'm sorry. I don't have the ingredients. Mom told me how to make them, but I don't have the stuff. How about some bacon and eggs and some special toast? He nodded and she left and the waitress came back and took the rest of our order. We ate, we left, we were completely satisfied. And I'm going to sidebar here for just a second. There's this idea of satisfaction is intriguing to me because most people go through life searching for satisfaction, right? In business, we talk about client satisfaction, mm -hmm. employee satisfaction, customer satisfaction. I mean, Mick Jagger's been chasing satisfaction his whole <laughs> life and he can't find it. He right? made a good living out of it. <laughs> right? He did, he did, but he can't find it. And yeah. I'm intrigued by this because when, when we're satisfied, Brian, we don't go tell anybody that we're satisfied. Right. There's only, there's only two times people talk about us. When we exceed their expectations or miss them completely, satisfaction doesn't get us a ticket to the bands. Mm -hmm. That day we were satisfied, we left, and that was that. But when we got up the next morning, I said to Josh Brown, I said, Josh, where do you want to have breakfast today? And he said, Dad, I want to go see Aunt B. Mm. And I, I looked at Lisa and I said, who? She said, the executive chef. Her name was B, B-E-A. He said, Dad, I want to go see Aunt B. I said, are you sure? We've, there's, other, there's so many other places to go. And he said, Dad, I want to go see Aunt B. And we went back to that restaurant, Brian, and we didn't have a reservation. They had a table for us. Aunt B came out and she said, good morning, sunshine. And Josh said, good morning. She said, what's for breakfast? He said, apple pancakes. And she looked at him and said, sunshine, you've got it coming right up. Mm. And I jumped in. I said, hold, hold, hold on a minute, Aunt B. Do you remember us from yesterday? And she said, absolutely. I said, but do you remember that we, you, you, do you remember his diet? She said, yes, sir, I do. I said, Aunt B, yesterday you didn't have the ingredients. And she said, sir, why are you calling me Aunt B? <laughs> I said, you're right. That's fair. But B, yesterday you didn't have the stuff. And she said, true. I said, today you do? She said, yes. I said, where did you get it? She said, the store. And I said, so you sent someone to the store? She said, no. Stopped on my way home yesterday. Mm. And she said, it would be my honor to make him apple pancakes. Crazy. And Brian, I have to tell you, we ate at that restaurant every day for eight days. <laughs> This woman poured into my son. See, she didn't get caught up in the blame game and ask questions that, that most people ask about why they can't, why they don't, when is someone going to pay attention, when somebody can give me the stuff to do my job. She just said, what can I do to serve this child? What can I do to create a better outcome? That's what heroes do. They make life better. You know, I think about it. I think about how many people you've spoken to and how many people yeah. have read the book. I'm, I'm thinking of the tens and tens and tens of thousands of people yeah. Who've heard Aunt B's story? You've heard about Disney World. You've heard about. I mean, uh, you know, the Disney Channel should be featuring you on their their new uh, <laughs> their new streaming service, right? But that's what that's what a raving fan does. That's what someone who that's gets right. extraordinary that's service. Right. That's what somebody who meets an everyday hero does. Is you're so blown away. You're so blessed by it. They they met more than your transactional need. They met your emotional need. They did something for your son that's unforgettable, and it's a uh, you know, it's that small but very powerful, intentional thing. And you've become one of the greatest spokesmen for Disney World yeah. anywhere in the world, yeah. right? Yep, yep, absolutely. And it's a, it's a remarkable thing. And, and Josh is 21 years old. And, I, and I'll fast forward through a little bit of this story. But they also had an, an encounter 
when he graduated from high school. Mm. He graduated with honors. And we asked him, son, what would you like to reward you for this remarkable achievement? Now, not only did he graduate, he graduated with honors. And we said, what wow. can we possibly do to reward you? And he said, Dad, I want to go see Aunt B. And when that boy <laughs> was 18 years old, we went back to see Aunt B. And Josh and Aunt B will be tethered forever. <laughs> Because of one moment in time, one moment in time can change everything in your life. And one moment Mm. in time can allow you to help someone else change their life if you're willing. Right. And it's just that constant deal. And this is what, this is how this gal was doing her business every day. This is how she was doing her job. She was looking for opportunities like that. And and along the way, something spectacular happens. And I think, you know, you keep showing up and doing your thing, more and more powerful things happen. Before I uh, give you our wrap up questions here that I've done so many times, I do want to just champion people. The book's called The Hero Effect. And uh, Kevin and I become pals. He's not here today to pitch a book. I'm here today to pitch the book because uh, it's a one-day read, which I love the format. It's unintimidating. It's well done. It's well laid out. It's, it's really the way the people can consume a book today. It's being your best when it matters most. And, you know, whether the dynamic of the world needs heroes My quest for heroes started with a question, what does a hero look like? I love the fantastic four qualities of a hero. You tell Josh's story, you lay it into the principles and the process with Aunt B, and then you challenge people, which is what we're all about here at this podcast, to how a person can unleash their hero. And I just think uh, it's a great message. You're out spreading the good news everywhere you go. You're bringing this principle-based message and, and sharing with people how to be their best. You know where you came from and uh, the dark places you came from, and that now all day long you're shedding the light for someone else. And we love you. We appreciate you. And it's been, a, it's been a great time together today. Before I let you go, we've had the who's who on our show, and I've asked everyone, you can imagine, these five questions. So this is your chance to get in the barrel here today, Kevin. And um, We'll find out a little bit about Kevin and, and uh, connect to the everyday hero of Kevin Brown to our lives here today. So here's my first question for you, bud. What was the best single piece of advice you've ever gotten? Never stop searching for the gifts that you were given. Mm. Where, where did you hear that? That was from David. Mm. David. David saw things in me that I never saw in myself. And when David, before David passed away, we sat on his patio. He was within weeks of, of his final breath. We sat on his patio in South Texas, and we sipped sweet tea and some other things. And talked about life. and reminisced, and before we, we left that day, he kind of looked away, and tears started streaming down his face, and he looked over at me and said, I'm proud of you, son. Uh, mm. those, are really, those are really powerful words, Brian, and mm-hmm. when, second only to the words, I love you, and we never outgrow the need to hear those mm. words, and, uh, but he looked at me, and he said, son, I'm not going to be here to teach you any longer. I'm not going to be here to remind you of what we've learned together. I need you to remember some things. I need to remember. I need you to remember, son. As long as there's a breath in your body, there's a version of you that you haven't even met yet. A version of you that the rest of the world desperately needs. Do not deprive this world of that version of you. I need you to keep working. I need you to keep digging. I need you to keep trying to find that version of you, and never ever quit searching for a better version of you. Mm, that's, where, that's where that came from. That's awesome. Words to live by. Mm. Thank no, you. Another question. What one talent or gift do you wish you possessed that you currently don't? <laughs> I wish I could sing. Come on. You know, I got to say, yeah. singing or playing an instrument is definitely always the, oh, the number man. one, right? Who's, who's, your, yeah. who's your go-to music? If, you have, uh, if you're in the car and you're getting your jam on, who's, who's, who's your guy or gal? Man, I, I'm, a, I'm a classic rock person. Come on. Oh. You know, I'm going to go to ACDC Come and on. Def Leppard and and uh, all the all the old powerhouse <laughs> standards. But but I have to tell you, probably my favorite group of all time is Foreigner. Oh, there we go, and, uh, Jukebox chance, Hero. I got you got it. You got a Jukebox Hero, and I got a chance to meet those guys a couple of weeks ago uh-huh. in Austin, Texas. I was speaking for a client, and they were the entertainment for that night's event. So I got to to check that off the list. That's awesome. There it is. There it is. Um. Let's say there's a movie on that you just uh, you you're scrolling through. You've been on the road for a few days. You're you're out of it. You're you're just trying to check out and you're you're channel surfing. And you've seen this movie a bunch of times, but every time it's on, you stop and take in a piece of it. What would that movie be? 
Uh, there's probably two of them. Can I give you two? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's, 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 there's one. It's called Roadhouse. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's an old Patrick Swayze movie. Yeah. And, uh, it, it's, just, it's got Sam Elliott. It's, it's a great movie. But my probably my favorite movie, the one I've seen probably more than anything else. And I'm not a TV guy. I'm not a movie guy. Yeah. I don't watch a lot of TV. But Forrest Gump is a, uh, <laughs> is a classic that I love to watch. Yep. It's very it's just very well done. So they say speaking is like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going <laughs> to get. <right? laughs> uh, that's cool. That right. I'll finish up with this. Uh, what what one book has been most instrumental in your life? Uh, next to the Bible, I would say anything by Og Mandino. But mm-hmm. One of the books, one of the first books I ever read was Greatest Salesman in the World. Right. As a young salesperson, David David made me read that book. And, you know, I knew about that book because of my days with, with Paul Meyer and, and Leadership Management Institute. But anything by Og Mandino, but one of his greatest books, and I don't know a lot of people know about, know about it, it's called The Spellbinder's Gift. Mm-hmm. And it was one of the greatest books, and especially doing what I do for a living now and, and, and having the, the privilege and the honor of taking the stage. The Spellbinder's Gift was was extraordinarily influential in my life. That's great. Well, you are a Spellbinder, and that was actually part of the feedback we got. We had 4,000 people in San Diego last August, and people were just saying, I was spellbound, and they loved it. Mm. My family loved it, and you're one of the best uh, to do it. You're out there spreading a great message, and I think it's a message of encouragement and hope and transparency, and you're helping a lot of people uh, change their lives every day. You've taken what David gave you. And uh, you're multiplying it uh, many times over. So we're proud to know you, proud to advance your cause, uh, proud to promote your books, and certainly excited to have you come back and speak to many Buffini & Company audiences in the future. So you're just a beaut. I so appreciate you being uh, on the podcast with us today, and I, I know you bless a lot of people by sharing your heart and stories here today. Thank you, Brian. What an honor. I love you guys. I appreciate what you guys do and pouring into my life and believing in what I'm doing, man. I just... I pinch myself nearly every day. To, to do what I do is extraordinary. It's a gift, and it's something that I'm not, not just proud of. It's just extraordinarily grateful. So thank you. Thanks for being in my corner. You bet. Well, I'm going to hand over our podcast today to our producer, Mr. David Lally. He's going to share some wisdom and insight for us. So thanks for joining us today, Kevin. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Brian. And uh, over to you there, David. Mr. Brown, what a treat to have you on the show. Let's all make that choice today to not be ordinary. I really enjoyed today's chat between these two gentlemen. And if you enjoyed it too, please share it with your friends and leave us a review on your podcast app. One listener on Apple Podcasts wrote, This is my favorite podcast. It's always hard hitting, has a great variety of topics, and gives me what I need to continue on my path. You always come away with nuggets that are great suggestions for life, personal development, business, and finance. Well, thanks for your kind words, Trey. We love hearing how The Brian Buffini Show is impacting all of you. And with that, we'll send you on your way with the words of one of our heroes, Therese Buffini. May the road rise up to meet you, and may the wind always be at your back. May the rain fall soft upon your fields, and the sun shine warm upon your face. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the hollow of his hand. See you next time. (laughs) 